In this episode, we're going to take a look at the ultimate guide to getting started with Microsoft 365 for administrators. And I guarantee the ultimate guide. Are you ready? Greetings fellow YouTubers, welcome to the channel and a year. So nice to see you, I really do appreciate it. You know, I was looking through all my videos yesterday and I realized I don't have one single video on actually getting started with Microsoft 365. And I thought, gosh, that's weird. I've done lots of little videos with like the various topics, but nothing definitive. So this is going to be more than a video. This is an absolute beginner's guide to Microsoft 365 for admins to get up and running. All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk about the different plans and how it works. We'll talk about the different portals and how they work. Talk about creating users and licensing. Then ultimately we'll talk about groups and how groups work. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about admin roles as well. So kind of the kind of five key core areas that will really get you up and running with Microsoft 365 in less than no time. Now, if you've got questions, comments about this or any of my other sessions, I love those, get them down below. And if you enjoy the session, please hit the like button. I really do appreciate it. And if you want to subscribe, we'd love to have you on board. So help hit that subscribe button up there, ring that bell, and you'll be notified of new videos. So I think without any further ado, I've got a little presentation which is intermixed with lots of demos. So stay tuned because I guarantee you will learn something here. Let's get started and I hope you enjoyed the session. A quick look then at an absolute beginner's guide for administrators in Microsoft 365. So this is perfect if you're just coming to the platform or if you already know the platform, that you might find things here that you may not necessarily know. So we're going to talk about what is Microsoft 365. We're going to talk about where it's really come from, but also where do all the different pieces kind of fix together and what are they? Well, if you're an old timer like me, um, well, back in the 1960s, I was a baby, so I wasn't that guy. Um, but really, um, I suppose the 1980s are really when things started and we went through the client server era. And as, as I always tell my students, that's a little bit like um, the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s. So basically, you go into work in the morning uh, you work in the factory, at the end of the day, you come out of the factory. And it's just the same with the computers as it was then. So we weren't 24-7 in those days. Then, of course, we had the mobility era. Everybody's walking around with mobile devices now. And now life in the cloud, it really doesn't matter what type of device that you use. Really now it's how I can consume my data and how I can consume it in a secure way. So when we talk about 365, um, 365 has really been evolving over a number of years. It started out as a product called BPOS, the Business Productivity Online Suite. You know, that marketing guy doesn't work at Microsoft anymore. It then went to Office 365. And of course, it's now uh, Microsoft 365. And it's essentially as a service. So basically, it's everything's hosted in Microsoft data centers throughout the world. So whether it be Microsoft Exchange Online, Microsoft SharePoint, and Microsoft Teams. So these are the core products that really kind of get things moving in Microsoft 365. Now, in addition to the core products, of course, um, you also get additional products thrown in as well. And you can basically add on essentially what you want or what you need for your business. And you can do these on an either on an ad hoc basis or you can have them over a yearly subscription. 
So when we talk about the benefits of 365, really we're talking about the fact that, hey, you know, do you want to use the cloud app? So we have something called the F plans. So the F plans um, are essentially kind of kiosk plans. So if you work in a call center, let's say, you might not need um, an actual install of Microsoft Office. You might be happy with the online version, which are, are excellent, by the way. Whereas if you're a, obviously a, a busy or a heavy user, you maybe got a laptop, you maybe travel, then you definitely want to have an installed copy of Microsoft Apps. Um, nice thing about this, of course, is it's a subscription service. So essentially, um, all you're, you're always going to be up to date. So you never need to go out and purchase the new software. You will always have the latest version. The downside of that though, is that you're responsible for your hardware. So you need to make sure that your hardware can meet those requirements. Um, of course, the idea is that irrespective of the device that you're coming in on, you're always gonna get a great um, kind of optimized experience. Of course, other than the free version, so you know, I'm often asked what's the difference between Microsoft 365 and the likes of OneDrive. Um, Andy, I get a free version of 365 with that. You do, but you don't get a service level agreement. So an SLA is a guarantee of quality, guarantee of uptime, and of course it's financially backed as well. Um, uh, of course, you get advanced IT controls in place. Link, gosh, Link doesn't exist anymore. That's a slightly older slide. Apologies for that. Of course, it's now Microsoft Teams. Um, so understanding where your data is stored, this is the Microsoft Data Center in Dublin in Ireland. And your data will be stored in vast data centers like this, either regionally or in many cases now locally. So local data centers are needed Obviously, if you're if you want to store financial information, government information and so on, or proprietary information for compliance reasons, it needs to be stored in your local data center. Now, I'm often asked, Andy, what is the best plan for me? How do I select the best plans? Well, as I've mentioned, obviously, Microsoft have their various services there. So Teams, SharePoint, Exchange and so on. What they then do is they basically put them into service plans. So these are the capabilities that are offered to a tenant user. So for example, SharePoint Online for Enterprise. Now, when we talk about the service plans, we then put them into SKUs. So for example, an E5 SKU, um, Microsoft 365 Business or Business Premium. Um, the smaller business plans, can handle up to 300 users and the enterprise plans such as E3 and above can have essentially unlimited numbers of users. So what are the layers of 365? Well, basically we've got essentially the portals on top. So you've got the landing pages, you've got the, la the sign in experience, you've got tenant administration, of course, and then you've got the user portals on top of that. Underneath, you've got the platform services. So commerce and billing, you've got Microsoft's uh, identity platform, its authentication platform. Of course, it's uh, internet DNS services. Uh, you've got SharePoint Online. Uh, you've got Exchange Online, Teams. And of course, you've got um, Yammer and all those other uh, communication tools as well. So now when we talk about navigating the cloud, uh, one of the first things that you need to know is how and what are all the different portals. So let's take a quick look at that. So a good place to start, I suppose, is at the beginning. And this is our Welcome to Microsoft 365 screen. So the place to get started for admins is, first of all, we go over here into the admin center. So let's take a look at that. So here in the admin center, this is your portal, your window to the world to view everything. Um, you can, you have, first of all, you'll notice that we have these cards. Now you can move these and drag and drop these and, and arrange them to exactly how you want them to look. You can also add new cards as well. So I can change the dashboard view. I can customize it. You can even go into dark mode if you want to. Uh, and you can also jump back into light mode. Again, whatever you prefer. 
Now, in terms of the various portals, um, we have a number of portals here. And one of the first things that you'll, you might find a little overwhelming is, first of all, click on Show All. So this is the main Microsoft 365 admin portal, and you'll get what we call a generic set of tools here. So you can manage your users, teams and groups, admin roles, you'll manage your resources, the marketplace, this used to be the billing section. Um, so these two kind of go together. So if you want to add features and functionality, you can do that. Billing, of course, you know, for paying your accounts. Then you've got support, so help desks. You've got your Microsoft 365 admin settings. Um, and again, this can be a little overwhelming because there are many settings. Um, Setup, so initial setup, getting started, and you can either do this through a manual setup or you've got this guided setup here that will take you through the whole thing. We also have a series of reports, so you can uh, produce reports, who are your heaviest users, what are the busiest sites and that kind of thing. And we also have the overall health, so you get this nice health dashboard what's the overall health of microsoft 365 please note that this relates to your local data center so you can see there's no critical alerts no problems now again depending on your license or your SKU or your plan that you're subscribed to you may get some or all of these settings all right so um, the other portals that we have, we have a number of different admin centers. So we have the security admin center, and this portal can either be managed by yourself or a dedicated security administrator. And the name of this portal is Microsoft 365 Defender. And this is where you would manage all the security for your tenant. So things like um, anti-malware, anti-spam, anti-virus, things like attachments, um, securing endpoints, vulnerabilities, and so on. Again, if you're interested in this area, check out my playlist for Microsoft 365 Defender. Um, I've got quite a few videos in this area to help you get started. Now, in addition, we also have the Microsoft Purview portal. So Microsoft Purview is all about compliance and we live in an increasingly compliant world. So this is not just protecting your users, but also protecting your things like communications, ensuring that they are compliant. Things like uh, data loss prevention policies, so ensuring uh, data doesn't leak outside of your uh, or confidential data doesn't leak, things like credit card information and so on. You can also do things like um, labeling and classification with information protection. So you can label um, sensitive information. For example, it can either be encrypted or you can put rules on that prevent this being sent outside your company. Absolutely superb. And then, of course, you've got things like um, uh, pr data loss prevention, so or data retention, I should say. So things like um, retaining data for compliance reasons. So if you'd like to know more about Purview, then check out my compliance playlist and Microsoft Purview on my YouTube channel. All right. Um, next one down is Endpoint Manager, soon to be renamed as the Intune uh, Portal. So uh, Intune, uh, in fact, there you go. You can see it's now been updated. Um, Intune manages all of your mobile and physical devices within your organization. So this can include Windows, iOS, Mac OS devices, Android, Chrome, and Linux devices as well. So you can enroll devices into your organization and you can then manage those through what we call configuration policies, and you can set compliance policies as well. So you can prevent users from, for example, installing applications or older versions of software that you don't want to support. 
Now, in addition to that, you can also, of course, manage users' apps. You can deploy apps to users' devices. You can manage things like updates um, to make sure that their systems are up to date. And this is the job of Intune Admin Center. In addition, you've also got tools like endpoint security. And endpoint security can prevent um, bugs and security issues from arising on mobile devices, for example. So again, we have a lot of security features here. Um, and if you'd like to know more about this, then please check out my Intune playlist on my YouTube channel. Next one down, um, very important, is the Azure Active Directory Admin Center. So Azure Active Directory is the heart of everything that we do in 365. It manages all our users and groups. And you're probably thinking, hang on a minute, Andy, there's something wrong here. Um, I just saw uh, in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center something called Users. And you're quite right. And in fact, if I go into the users here, you'll see that I have a list of users. And likewise, if I go into my Azure Active Directory Admin Center and click on users, again, you'll see a list of those same users. Hmm. So which one would I use? To be honest, it doesn't matter. All right. Now, because this is a cloud service, you'll probably end up working with both, if I have to be honest with you, all right? Now, um, some features can only be managed in the 365 portal, whereas some features can only be managed in the Azure portal. I know what you're thinking. You, isn't there a, a portal kind of one for all and all for one? Unfortunately not. That's the nature of the cloud, I'm afraid. But with a little practice, you'll soon get the hang of it. So Azure Active Directory is the core identity service in Microsoft 365. All right. So what else have we got here? Well, um, other, other admin centers include Microsoft Exchange Online. So in here, you can see you can manage all of your mail, how mail flows into your organization, mail migration, so migrating mail in to your organization from various sources. This is a super powerful feature. Again, it can be managed either by a global admin or in many cases, you might have a dedicated exchange mail admin um, within your organization. So all our storage is managed in SharePoint here. And this is the main storage for things like Microsoft 365 groups and Teams as well. Please note, you can also manage OneDrive for business in here as well. And then of course, we have the Teams Admin Center. So communications, chat, collaboration. This is where um, your Teams administrator would sit and they would manage all the communications. So everything from meetings to Teams voice. Um, so things like deploying Teams apps to your users in Microsoft Teams, managing Teams devices, such as things like Teams rooms, collaboration systems, and so on. Again, if you're interested in Teams, check out my Teams playlist on YouTube. Okay, so having looked at the portals then, what, are, what is the next most important thing? Are you going to be a scenario where you are on premises? So many companies still have an on-premises kind of infrastructure in place, or are you going to go directly to the cloud with the likes of Microsoft Azure? Now, of course, Azure and its technologies allow me to communicate and connect with lots of different platforms. So, you know, there's lots of, basically Microsoft call themselves now a multi-cloud solution. So whether you're working with uh, Amazon or Google, you, uh, you can link in with Azure Active Directory for that. You might also want to work with customers or partners. And we have a B2B platform, the capabilities to not just have your own internal users, but also invite guests um, from partnerships or customers um, to collaborate. Yes. So, of course, tools like Microsoft Teams are fantastic. 
We also have another type of identity called um, B2C or business to consumer. So if you're, let's say, developing your own app, for um, your website and you want your users to be able to register for that website. Well, of course, users or customers might not have an Azure account. So again, they can come in and they can sign in via their Facebook page or their Twitter page or something like that. Now, what about on-premises? Well, if you've got on-premises Active Directory, of course, that's the traditional Active Directory service of Windows Server then we're going to need to get, how do we get those users into the cloud? So for that, on premises, you install a tool called Azure AD Connect or Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync. And what this tool does, it essentially connects to your on-premises environment. You put in your credentials for on-premises, you put in your credentials for cloud, it then connects those two components together and essentially it pulls users, groups uh, and contacts into your Azure portal and it connects them, it links them together. All right. Now, once you've done that, of course, you can then license those users. And we refer to this as a hybrid scenario. If you want to know more about that, check out my identity um, playlist because I go through this in much more detail. Well, so Azure uh, provides the directory service for Microsoft now. This is the next generation of directory services. And you can see it comes in a number of different flavors. So there's a, a free version, actually. There's the basic edition. Um, so the basic edition is great um, if you're using, you know, uh, kind of business versions of Azure Active Directory. And then, of course, we have a couple of versions of premium, which give you even uh, greater functionality, for example, enhanced security features and so on. So identity is super important. So how are your users going to authenticate? Well, you can use tools like Password Hash Sync and Password Hash Sync is very clever. So when a user account replicates from on-premises into the cloud with the hybrid scenario, the only component or attribute that doesn't come along is the user's password. So what happens with that? Well, it goes through a mathematical cryptographic process called a hashing algorithm. And essentially, um, it produces a, a, a fixed kind of uh, value, a long, long, long series of digits. And essentially that goes through two hashing algorithms plus something called salting where it throws a random number on the end. And it's that value, this long value that's stored in Azure. So when the user authenticates, they essentially compare their hash value with what's on what they have on premises with what they've got in the cloud. So at no point is a password ever replicated across. You can also have federated identities and these provide things like single sign-on solutions. So what about the admin tools that are available? Well, we have the admin center, of course, the 365 uh, admin center. Now, I don't know if you've seen the um, admin tool for mobile devices. There's also one for Android uh, as well as Apple devices there. So you can go ahead and you can download that as well. Now, as well as the portals, of course, we also have PowerShell, incredibly powerful command line tool. And if you're a developer, of course, then you can use the management, the various APIs or application programming interfaces. So as you can see here, you've got the 365 Admin Center here. You've got the Azure portals. You've got PowerShell and you've got the 365 Admin app. So I suppose the next demo uh, should be, let's take a look now at managing users and licensing. So when we talk about creating users and so on in Microsoft 365, the first thing that we need to think about is where are we going to create things? This is what we call Microsoft Entra. And Microsoft Entra essentially is the identity portal in Microsoft Azure and Microsoft 365. And you can see the first thing it talks about tenants. What is a tenant? And think of uh, Act, our Azure Active Directory 
as a filing cabinet and Microsoft look after this filing cabinet. So within the filing cabinet, you'll have a drawer. This is your tenant. So within your tenant, you will essentially manage all of your users, groups, devices, and you're responsible for that. You can either be a what we call a global admin or you can assign um, kind of lower admin roles or dedicated admin roles to other users. So, for example, you might have users who manage Exchange or SharePoint and so on. So in creating users, as I've mentioned, we can create a user object in Azure Active Directory. But of course, you can also create the same users in Microsoft 365 as well. And you can do exactly the same thing. So again, there is no one portal to rule them all here. So essentially we can do this from either location. There are some features that are only available in Microsoft 365, and there are some features available in Azure Active Directory um, and either portal. Uh, initially, this may seem a little confusing, but believe me, you'll quickly get used to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into active users. And one of the first things that we're going to want to do is create a user here. And I'm going to create a user. I'm a big Trekkie. So I'm going to create a user here called Jean-Luc. Um, and we'll call him Jean-Luc Picard. All right. And you can see it puts the display name in. And I can put in a username. Now, just a quick tip. Um, you don't want to call the user Jean-Luc or Bob or Steve. Um, the reason, I mean, you could do if there was only one Jean-Luc in the company or one Steve in the company. But if you've got, you want to have a decent naming standard. So in this case, a common naming standard is to use the surname followed by an initial. One of the things you may want to take a look at on my YouTube channel um, in my tips and tricks uh, playlist is all about DNS in Microsoft 365. And it shows you how you can create your own custom domain name. So if you don't want this tenant dot on Microsoft.com, you can, of course, you can create your own. So bobsboats.com or whatever your domain name might be. And that's really, really simple. I'm going to click next. And now it asks me, hey, you know, first of all, where do you want the user to be located? Now, this is really important for compliance reasons. So, for example, in this example, I'm located in the United States. But again, you can choose whether you want it to be in the UK or in Norway or in wherever it might be. And this is where their data is going to be resident. And that's really important. The next thing we want to do is, of course, assign a license for Jean-Luc. And you can see there are a number of different license plans available. Um, again, uh, one of the things you might want to do is just before you sign up for 365, if you haven't already done so, is just have a look at the different plans that Microsoft has to offer. And just to remind you, by the way, you can try all of these for free. So this is a great way to learn the different plans and the different features. And you can scroll down and it shows you what features are available with the different plans. OK, now, in addition, you can also bolt things onto your plan as well. So, for example, I am going to, let's say, give um, Jean-Luc, I'm going to give him a, an E5 subscription. But at the same time, I'm going to bolt on e Enterprise Mobility and Security. So this gives him an Intune license, but it also adds in some additional security features as well. Now, Jean-Luc is using a Windows 11 laptop, so I'm going to create a, um, a license for that as well. In fact, that's actually included in the license. Now, just as well as that, you can see all the apps that the license provides for the user. Now, Andy, what if a user you don't want a user to have a particular app? Well, all you do is just uncheck that app and you're pretty much done. All right. So I'm going to click next. And the next thing then, I mentioned these things called roles. So um, the, the moment by default, the user has no admin access. 
Um, but if you do want him to have some kind of admin access, you can uh, obviously assign what we call an admin role. Now, just to let you know that the global administrator is God, basically, and this guy can pretty much do anything. Um, I generally wouldn't recommend that. So you want to really keep the number of global admins to an absolute minimum for best practice. But let's say, for example, um, you want him to be a, a SharePoint administrator or Teams. So you want Jean-Luc to manage all your collaboration features. Well, this is called RBAC, Role-Based Access Control. So I'm just giving him the permissions that he needs not necessarily what he wants. Again, for more details on role-based access control, please check out my identity playlist and I have dedicated videos on this subject. I'm going to click next and there we go. I have now created my user. So just one last little thing, which is a really cool tip, by the way, when you finish creating the user, off it will go and it will create that user account. It can take a few minutes. One of the things that you can do is you can actually name this user and you can make it a template. All right. Uh, and when you create a template, um, I'm not going to create a template here with this particular user. But if I did, I give it a name, let's say full time staff and so on. This is really cool because if I go and create a new user again, uh, instead of just adding a user, I can add in a template. And here's some templates that I created previously. So I've gone ahead, I've created Jean-Luc. So here he is. I can go into Jean-Luc's uh, account now. And we can see that in here, you can manage all of his devices. You can manage, uh, you can see if he's got any devices rather assigned. You can see what licenses Jean-Luc has got. Um, uh, again, and you can change these licenses. So in the old days, of course, if you change the license, it might have caused serious problems. It doesn't anymore. We can see Jean-Luc's mail, email settings here. So if you'd like to know more about Exchange, then check out my Exchange playlist um, on my YouTube channel as well. Finally, we have uh, Jean-Luc's OneDrive. And at the moment, this is still provisioning, so it's not complete yet. So if I came back in a little bit of time, that would be finished. The other thing you can do, of course, is you can also add in some contact information for Jean-Luc here as well. I can also reset Jean-Luc's password. I can block his sign-in if I don't think he's ready to be signed in yet. And ultimately, I can also delete the user as well. Just a quick point about deleting a user. If you delete a user, um, essentially what will happen is it goes into the deleted users containers and it goes in here for up to 30 days. So should I want to restore a user back? And here I've got... Um, I used this one before. Um, if I've got a user here called Captain Kirk, I can simply restore this user back. Okay, so there we go. That's that user uh, restored. So there you have it. Just the basics of creating and licensing a user account. So what are some of the things that can affect your desktop, for example? Well, of course, we have the Office apps and you can download the Office apps from your portal or they can be pushed out to you via an administrator. Now, in terms of licensing, you can have for the desktop product, you can have up to five PCs or Macs. Uh, in terms of mobile devices, you can have more. So potentially you could have like 15 different devices um, if you want to. You can roam with those devices. So you can open an item and open a document on one item and continue it on another item. As I said, upgrades are always included. It's super easy to install. And I'm sure many of you have already deployed this. Now, I'm often asked, how do we keep your content safe? Well, um, super easy. So for, let's take OneDrive for Business, for example. Um, so OneDrive for Business, essentially, of course, you're working on a document, um, you save it to your desktop. This is then synced to your local data center and it's synced to a data array, which is then replicated. So again, we have a, it's raided, which means 
Um, it's mirrored and you also get a, a duplicate copy of it. Now that rack is also replicated to a second rack in the data center. So that's four copies of your data before we even start. That Those racks are also replicated to a sister data center for additional security. On top of that, of course, we also have scheduled backups and just in time uh, restore points. Uh, or previous versions, as you maybe want to call them. And I actually showed this recently in my recent OneDrive video on how you can get a restore back. Okay, so super cool features. And as you can see, there's at least 10 copies of your data. I'm often asked, Andy, is it a good idea to think about a third party backup? Well, that's something I'm going to be addressing in a future uh, episode of this show. So watch out for that. Now, I'm often asked, what about migration? So if I want to migrate my content into Microsoft 365, what are the options? Well, typically with mail migration, you go into the Exchange Admin Center and we have essentially four options. So an IMAP migration is essentially where I can migrate just mail. So this would just bring just email in. The, from the likes of any third party product that you're using. So if it's not Exchange, it would just bring in the email. If you are using Exchange on premises, then you can either use something called a cutover migration or a staged migration. Now, technically, these are almost identical. But the one, well, the one thing that's different is with an IMAP migration, I would need to create all the user accounts and mailboxes first. And essentially, when you run the migration, it, it's just a connector that's connecting from the old mailbox to the new mailbox, and it's copying the content across. With a cutover and staged mailbox, it creates the mailboxes and the user accounts for us. So we don't need to create all of that stuff. So during the migration process, it creates the user accounts and mailboxes, copies the content across, and then all we need to do is license the user at the end. With a hybrid deployment, this is if you have a more complex environment, maybe thousands of users, and you can't do a migration over the weekend. So this is great. It's designed to be a kind of a, a, a longer term connector, if you will. And the idea is that you can then move users, mailboxes across as, you know, whatever's convenient for you. And at the end of the day, you can then cut that cord and uh, send that old uh, crusty server on its way. Content services for 365, of course, um, it's all about collaboration, isn't it? So um, at the very heart of 365, we have SharePoint, which SharePoint, of course, is responsible for storage of all our files and of our data. On top of that, uh, as well as users, you can create groups as well. And groups are particularly powerful because you can assign group owners and there are different types of groups. So in addition to a security group, we can also have a Microsoft 365 group. And this offers a fully collaborative experience. So you can have things like a shared mailbox, shared calendar, a planner, a SharePoint team site, and so on. And if you want to go one step further, you can extend the capabilities of the Microsoft 365 group to become a Microsoft team. And a team means that you can communicate with it, you can set up chat functions, and you can also assign third party apps to it as well. So SharePoint and OneDrive, uh, really, it's all about storage. SharePoint provides the storage for groups and teams. OneDrive for Business provides the storage for users. So the last thing that I just want to do is let's take a quick look now at managing groups. So next, let's talk about teams and groups. And to do this, I'm going to click in the admin center and I'm going to go into active teams and groups, first of all. Now, first of all, you'll notice here that you have got four types of groups. 
So a security group is exactly as it says on the tin. It's for assigning permissions and nothing more. And really, this is to do with the levels of collaboration that you want to have in Microsoft 365. A mail enabled security group is just a security group that's attached to a distribution list. That's it. So it's not mailbox enabled. It doesn't have a mailbox. It's just mail enabled. You can also have just a distribution list on its own. So for distributing mail and things like that. And we also have this, a Microsoft 365 group. A Microsoft 365 group is a fully collaborative group and it contains a number of different Microsoft technologies. Let me show you. So I'm gonna create a new Microsoft 365 group. I'll click next. I'm going to call this my Aberdeen HQ. And I'm going to click, I could put in a description, but I'll just click next here. Do I want to assign an owner? So an owner is like a manager. Do you want to assign a member of staff who's going to manage this for me? So in this case, I'm going to assign myself. So I've got a user here, just it's a little demo user. It's just called CDX, and I'll bring this user in. Um, next, I want to add some members to the group. So who do I want to add in? Well, I'm going to bring in Alex. I'll bring in Alan. I'll bring in Bianca. And I think I'll bring in Cameron and Christy. So I'm going to, I've got five users here. I'm going to add them into the group. Now, I've mentioned that I want this to be a Microsoft 365 group. So I'm just going to put in the name of the group, which you can change anytime. And you'll notice that you can email this group. This is a, an emailable group. We also can now assign a sensitivity label. So is this a confidential group? Is it managers? And again, you can assign the sensitivity label based on the sensitivity of the group. You can also manage the privacy of it. So is it going to be a public or a private group? Private groups can only be accessed by members of that group, whereas a public group can be accessed by anyone. So I'll make this public and I'll show you what I mean. Do you want to create a team for the group? So I'm going to say no just for the purpose of this demo and I'll click next and I'm going to go off and create that group. So I'm going to create the group and let's have a quick look at what that group looks like. So I'm going to go into, let's say, Microsoft Outlook here. And here in Outlook, uh, you can see as well as my mailboxes, I've also can scroll down and you can see I've got a number of groups here. And I can see that there are a number of groups. I can discover groups. So I can come in here and I can say, yeah, I want to discover a group called Aberdeen. And you can see that, in fact, we do have a group called Aberdeen. Now, because this was a public group, as I mentioned, anyone can join that group. If this was a private group, you can request access to the group. All right. So I've now joined that group. And if I just uh, close that down, you can now see that here I am in the Aberdeen HQ group. So what we have is, first of all, we have a shared mailbox. Um, we have, let me just close that down. We have a shared mailbox. You also have um, shared document library so we can share a document library so col for collaboration you have a shared calendar and you've got a notebook planner a team site and so on not a team site but a SharePoint website rather now um, okay so what's the difference between this and a Microsoft team well a team is a, an extension of a Microsoft 365 group so if I just come out of Outlook, first of all, and if I come back into Teams, 
So come back in here to Teams. So when I click on to Aberdeen HQ, um, I have a number of options. And it says, would you like to add Microsoft Teams to this group? Now, if you join a team, this is an irreversible action. And what it does, it extends the capability of the group to become a team. In other words, you can use it in Microsoft Teams to collaborate and share resources. And you can also use third party apps uh, with the team rather than just the Microsoft ones. So I'm going to say, yeah, I think I'll do that. Let's go ahead and click onto that. All right. So the other thing that we might want to do is you might want to say, OK, uh, if I want to add some members to the team, if I want to uh, in teams, of course, you can have kind of sub channels so I can create channels there. And then finally, in the settings, I can say, hey, do you want to let people outside of the organization join the team or the group? So yes, you can do that. And again, you've got that same privacy sharing settings that we had before. All right. Um, again, for groups, if you want to see a more detailed presentation on groups, please check out my identity playlist um, on my YouTube channel. So there you have it. Getting started with Microsoft 365, especially for you guys, the administrators. Hey, I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, bump that like button up there. It does make a difference to the channel. And if you've not subscribed, well, come on on board. Hit that subscribe button up there. Ring that bell and you'll be notified of new videos coming up. And I've got some cool stuff planned as well. Thanks very much. Comments, questions, of course, as always, get them down below and I'll do my best uh, for you. That's it for this time. You stay safe. I'll see you soon. Hey, thanks so much for dropping by today. Here's a couple of videos that you may enjoy. And while you're here, go ahead, click on the subscribe button and you won't miss out.